Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Science with Mr. Emont. Today we are going to be continuing to learn about the evidence of evolution and we are going to be focusing in, to, on, in today on selective breeding and artificial selection. Words that are often used interchangeably. Selective breeding has to do where, with man intervening in the breeding process of species. And the reason why we would intervene in the breeding process of species is to select individuals who we want to breed because they have desired traits. And we want their offspring, their babies, to also display those desired traits. So we are going to interfere in the process. We're going to pick individuals who have a trait that we like, and we're only going to allow them to breed so that their offspring also show that trait. Individuals who don't have that trait that we like, we may kill them, make them infertile so that they cannot pass on their genes. We might do something to prevent them from passing on undesirable traits. And that, in a nutshell, is selective breeding. Artificial selection is a word that's used to describe a forced form of natural selection. So Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is the theory that we're going to be learning about in future lessons, has to do with desired traits, but we don't really call them desired traits. We call them traits that offer an individual a competitive advantage over its competitors, right? So let's say that you live in an environment where the food is found up high in trees. What would be a desired trait for reaching that food? Maybe longer necks. And longer necks would then be the trait that is selected for in nature, not by man. Just because you have a longer neck, you're able to reach that food. Well, individuals with longer necks, they're going to be able to survive a little better. And over millions and billions of years, necks will get longer and longer and longer until you have, you guessed it, a giraffe. Right? That's natural selection. And obviously there's going to be different environmental pressures that cause different changes in species as they try to adapt to their environments. And we will go through how natural selection works and the theory behind it. Artificial selection is very different, right? Because the environment, nature itself is not the thing that is choosing, choosing which traits get propagated. Instead, we are we are deciding what traits we like and what traits will move on to future generations. That is the difference between artificial and natural selection. When we select specific traits, that trait is gonna become more common in successive generations. So in future generations, when we pick a specific trait, like for example, uh, with the husky, why are we, what are we breeding in the husky? We're breeding long fur because they need to be adapted to cold weather. We're breeding them to be large and stocky and tough and fast. And that's because they were originally bred as sled dogs. But we also want them to be friendly because they're also our companions. And we want them to be aggressive towards other species, not us, because they also filled the role as protectors of villages and families. Those traits become more common as we breed them. We only allow the dogs who are exhibiting those traits to reproduce. And selective breeding often is used as evolu evidence for evolution because over the course of thousands of years, in the case of dogs, for example, in about 30 to 50,000 years, we went from only having the gray wolf into having hundreds of different breeds of dogs that look drastically different, have different temperaments, uh, 
have different traits that are suited to different conditions. It's amazing what we have done through the breeding of dogs. It is one of the most profound examples of microevolution in such short periods of time and going from something that is a stock like the gray wolf to having such huge variation in traits. And eventually these different dog breeds, if we keep breeding them and isolating the gene pools of the different breeds and breeding them for specific traits, they may eventually become different species. Right now they're all Canis domesticanus, which means the domestic dog, that's their Latin name. They are all domestic dogs and they can breed together, right? We can take a Husky and a Labrador and come up with offspring that's somewhere in between the two. They can reproduce and they can create offspring who can also reproduce, meaning they're fertile offspring. And if you remember from 10th grade science, our definition of a species, species are groups of organisms that can potentially interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Maybe at some point the genes within the Husky and the Labrador will be so different that their babies will not be able to reproduce themselves and they would be their own species. Let's look at some examples. The first example is breeding plant crops. And this is allowed for generation of many new types of foods from the same ancestral plant source. So for example, we selectively breed plants today uh, for many different functions, increasing the yield of our crops, improving the resistance of, to disease, improving the taste, removing seeds so that some people don't like, for example, seeds in their bananas. So we genetically and artificially select to remove seeds. And a good example of this is the plant Brassica oleraceae, this one right here, which is a wild mustard plant. And this wild mustard, this ancestral plant, was bred to produce many different types of foods by modifying individual sections of the plant to have the desired traits we want. Like for example, the flower buds and stems were, were artificially selected, not through modifying genes, but just through breeding, to lead to the formation of broccoli. Flower buds were modified in a different way to produce cauliflower. They're actually, this came from the same plant. The stem of the wild mustard plant formed kohlrabi. Kale was formed from the leaves of the plant. The leaf buds turned into cabbage and Brussels sprouts. All of these different foods that you can get in your grocery store today all came from an original wild mustard plant with the genus, genus and species name Brassica oleracea. It's amazing, right? What we can do with artificial selection. And many of you probably would have considered these different species of plants, different species of plants that all stemmed from the same original one caused by us selectively breeding choosing which traits to propagate and which ones not to. Let's watch this video. To watch that video, go ahead and click this link in the top right hand corner. This will take you to a direct link to that video. When you're done watching that video, come on back and we'll continue the lesson. And there you go. A few different examples of us breeding plants to produce desired traits through artificial selection. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, we are looking at the selective breeding of domesticated animals, in this case, horses. And there's other examples of domesticating animals, right? Cows and dogs, but let's look at horses first, something many of you should be familiar with. There's race horses, right? Race horses are typically bred for being leaner, lighter, taller, quicker. And then there's draft horses, which are bred for power and endurance and therefore are sturdier and stockier, right? And there's a whole bunch of different breeds, all of which uh, are used in modern society in different ways. The third example we're gonna talk about is cow breeding. Cow breeding is another great example of us selectively breeding individuals 
to, for our desired traits, right? Here's a normal cow and here's a cow that has not been genetically modified. It has only been selectively bred and artificially selecting for specific traits. What trait do you think was it selected for here? Muscle, right? Increased muscle mass. And we'll be able to learn a little bit more about the Belgian blue by watching this video here. Again, to watch that video, go ahead and click the link in the top right hand corner. And when you're done watching it, come on back and we'll continue the lesson. And there we go. Another great video demonstrating artificial selection and progress. Let's look at another example, dog breeding. Dog breeds show an enormous amount of variety. And this is because we have been targeting their traits in selective breeding for thousands of years. We have hunting dogs like beagles, which were bred to be smaller in stature so that they could enter foxholes, right? Other hunting dogs were bred to be much larger, to take down larger prey. It depends on the trait that we specifically wanted. Another good example is herding dogs, like sheep dogs, which were bred for their heightened intelligence. They have to be able to follow commands, right? To be able to herd the sheep properly back into the pens. Racing dogs, like greyhounds, another great example of artificial selection and selective breeding. They were bred to be specifically sleek and fast. And then you have all your toy dogs that are so popular today, like your chihuahuas, which are bred just for their diminutive size or cuteness, right? Looking for specific traits. So let's take a look at this video. It features Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of my favorite scientists, who explains how dogs evolved from wolves. And one last time to watch this video, in the top right hand corner, you'll find the link to it. Go ahead and watch it and come back when you're done. And there we go. What a great show. That is an excerpt from Cosmos, A Space Odyssey by Neil deGrasse Tyson. You can find bits and pieces of it on YouTube. Uh, you can also find it in HD on Disney Plus if you have a subscription to that. It's a great documentary series. I highly suggest watching it. You'll learn a lot. Let's move on. This is the last slide of the day. So it's just going to kind of review what's happening here. We have these domestic breeds and there's a lot of variation in them compared to wild populations. And the reason why there's such huge variation in traits in domestic breeds versus wild population is because wild populations are only subjected to natural selection and domestic breeds, we're the ones that are selecting which specific traits we want and we, need, we can manipulate the breeds in different ways because of that. And it all works in this fashion. So we know that in nature, every population has a variation in its traits, right? Not every individual of the population is a clone of the other one. They're all unique. What humans then do is we look at the individuals which do not have the desired traits we want and we just don't let them breed. That's it. We either kill them or we do something to prevent them from breeding. For the ones which have the traits that we want, we allow them and encourage them to breed together. This leads into the next generation of whatever it is we're breeding, dog, sheep, cow, to have more of that trait that we want because we have only allowed the individuals who show that desirable trait to breed, most of their offspring will inherit that trait. The ones that don't have that trait, what do we do to them? Unfortunately, we don't let them breed or we kill them, right? The ones that do have that trait, maybe even a more pronounced trait, we allow them to breed, right? If we're trying to breed for uh, increased size, we just allow the biggest ones to continue to breed and that should eventually result in very large individuals a few generations later, right? And this process is just repeated for however many generations we need to do it until we have the desired trait. And Neil deGrasse Tyson explained this very well in his video. 
we started with the clay that was the gray wolf and it led to all these kind of breeds of dogs simply because we wanted a specific trait and we bred for that trait. If you want something to be small with pointy ears, you breed the smallest one with the pointiest ears over and over and over again and you will achieve that. It's as simple as that. One final thought for you for the day. If artificial selection can have such amazing consequences over the course of only 20 to 50,000 years, what do you think natural selection can do over the course of billions of years? See you next time. Thanks for watching everybody. You can like, follow, and subscribe to my social medias to get notifications as soon as new content is uploaded. In the top corner here, you will find the playlist that this video is in. Watch the unit from beginning to end. And over here, you will find the next video in this unit. Keep learning everybody. Take care.